Now let's take a look at how today's session will look like. In our session today, we'll be looking at the performance objectives that we want to achieve on the topic that we are discussing. What are the aspects we are going to cover in this topic? Then we move straight to our lesson discussion, where we'll be able to understand and learn some concepts that has to do with cell, which is our topic. After that, we'll move into our session break. Immediately after the session break, we'll go into a session of question and answer. And after that, we'll be having our closing session. Unless I forget, in today's session also, you will have the privilege to vote for the next topic that will be treated in our live session next week. So just stick around, call your friends, tell them it is time to learn again at the comfort of your home, get your materials as we journey through this together. In our lesson today, we'll be focusing on the cell. That's our topic, cell. And in this topic, these are the objectives we want to achieve. We shall learn to define cell. Also, we shall learn to identify the types of cell that we have. We shall learn to state the cell theory. We shall also learn to describe different forms in which living cells exist. Then we move on to learn how to draw and label both plants and animal cells. Having learned how to draw, we differentiate between plants and animal cells. Also, we learn to identify the components of cells and the functions of these components. As we journey, as we learn this together, I need you to just sit around as we learn together. Now, what is a cell? What exactly is a cell? Before you can define a concept convincingly, that particular concept must be described vividly so much that if you are describing it or defining that particular thing, someone that has not seen that, that particular object before will be able to recognize and identify it at the first sight of that particular thing. You take, for instance, when you define water, you say, it's a liquid that is colorless, that is odorless and tasteless. You are trying to describe it for anyone to be able to identify it that, oh, when you see this liquid that is tasteless and colorless, the liquid is water. Now, what is a cell? You must have seen different definitions, different from different authors, different personalities. One of it is cell is the basic unit of life. The basic unit of life that can exist independently. The basic unit of life that can exist independently. The basic units of life that can exist independently. Now, looking at this definition, 
a zeta you put it as the basic unit or the smallest unit of life what are we trying to say what this definition is trying to tell us is that that part of a living thing life that can exist independently that is that can stay that can be on its own without depending on any other organism is what we refer to as cell so you can define cell as the basic unit of life or the smallest unit of life that can exist independently or you have another definition you say is the structure and functional unit of life now this is another definition of cell when you look at a cell from the angle of being a building block that is one of the things that will help to build an organism then we can say is a structural unit of life so this is another definition of cell now to give a full description of cell i have this definition for you a cell is the structural unit of most organisms don't forget structure because you are looking at a cell just like a building block and that's why some definitions will just put it as the building block of life now structural unit of most organisms consisting of a microscopic mass of protoplasm take note of that word protoplasm microscopic mass of protoplasm that is bounded by a semi permeable membrane and usually containing one nucleus now when you come across the word protoplasm at times when you see your cell labeled you may not see protoplasm there because protoplasm is the living component of the cell and it consists of cytoplasm and the nucleus so when we talk about protoplasm we are referring to cytoplasm and the nucleus so i take that definition again a cell is a structural unit of most organisms consisting of a microscopic mass of protoplasm bounded by a semi permeable membrane and usually containing one nucleus as you can see there is an example of the of a cell the image there i'm sure that should remind you of egg as if you are looking at the yolk in there that yolk like structure is the nucleus when we get to the parts of a cell we'll be talking about the other components our uh, argon discuss the definition of cell what are the types of cell that we have basically we have two types of cell two types we have eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells the word eukaryotic is from a greek word meaning true eukaryotic is from this eu it's a greek word that means true or well so when we talk about eukaryotic cells it's a cell that has a well developed nucleus a well developed nucleus while prokaryotic cells are cells without a well developed nucleus i think that again the basic difference between eukaryotic cell and prokaryotic cell is that eukaryotic cell contains a well developed nucleus while prokaryotic cells 
they lack a well-developed nucleus. Instead, they have what we call nucleoid. It's not a well-developed nucleus. The concept of cell is so important that cell is even used to classify organisms. Remember the classification of living things into kingdoms. Only kingdom Monera, as the first kingdom, they are prokaryotes, while other kingdoms are eukaryotes. And the representative of that kingdom is bacteria cell. So the kingdom Monera has prokaryotic cells, while other kingdoms, they have eukaryotic cells. Now, using cell to classify organisms, organisms can be classified based on the number of cells they have. So we classify organisms into two categories based on the number of cells they have and we have two categories there and we have unicellular then we have multicellular organisms. So based on the number of cells, organisms are classified as unicellular or multicellular. When we say unicellular organisms, we are referring to living organisms that are made up of only one cell, or you call them single-celled organisms. That's only one cell. You talk about paramecium, you talk about amoeba, they are one-cell organisms. Then we have multicellular, just like you, made up of different cells, multiple cells, many cells. So multicellular are many-celled organisms. So these are the types of organisms based on cells. Now let's move on to cell theory. When we talk about cell theory, cell theory is actually the ideas of scientists that worked on the discovery of cell. And the chief of all of these scientists is the father of cell himself. We call him Robert Hooke by the name Robert Hooke. He's the father of cell. In 1665, Robert Hooke made a discovery of cell. However, he observed something like a room or like a small box and he called the name cell. That word cell, it's a Greek word meaning small room. That was his observation. Then after Robert Hooke, other scientists like Felix Jujardin, Theodos Kuan, and many other they put down their own discoveries about cell. And these are put together to form what we refer to as cell theory. So when, we, when you're asked to state the cell theory, you should know that that is talking about the ideas of the scientists that worked on cell. So the first one states that cell is the basic unit of life. That's the first theory. It states that cell is the basic unit of life. That it is the smallest unit, the smallest aspect of life that can exist on its own. And the second one says, all living things are made up of one or more cells. All living things are made up of one or more cells. Don't forget if a living thing is made up of just one cell, it's referred to as unicellular. And if it's made up of more than one cell, that living organism is referred to as multicellular. So that theory is telling us that we have some organisms that are made up of one cell, and we have one, some made up of multiple cells. Then the third one, all existing cells... All existing cells come from the reproduction of pre-existing cells. 
That is to tell us that the cells that are in place now were reproduced by the cells that were in existence before them. So all the cells you see now were reproduced by the cells that were in place before them. And finally, a cell contains information for its structural and functional development in its nucleic acids. And this information is passed from parent to offspring cells. What is that telling us? That no matter how small a cell is, that particular cell has genetic information that can be passed from parent to offspring. And that's why unicellular organisms can reproduce to give birth to a similar or organism of its type because all cells, they have genetic materials that can be passed from one generation to another. So I run through the cell theory again. Cell is the basic unit of life. And the second one, all living things are made up of one or more cells. The third one, all existing cells come from the reproduction of pre-existing cells. And lastly, a cell contains information for its structural and functional development in its nucleic acids. This information is passed from generation to generation. That's from parents to offspring cells. Forms in which living cells exist. Now we have different cells, as you have been told. However, these cells exist in different forms. In different forms. And basically, we have four ways or four forms that these cells exist. The first one, living cells exist as independent or single, or we call it free living organisms. And the second one, living cell exists as a colony. Third one, living cells exist as a filament. And last one, living cell exists as part of a living organism. Now, what do we mean by living cell exists as independent organism? That is to tell us that some cells, they can exist on their own. And we are talking about unicellular organisms. That is, that is the only cell and it can carry out all the characteristics of living things on its own. It's not dependent on any other cell. So when a cell is existing as independent of free living, you should know that that cell is a unicellular organism. So that's number one. We have different cells that can exist as independent of free living. Your paramecium, your iglena, chlamydomonas, all the single-celled organisms, they exist as independent. As it's on its own, it can carry out the characteristics of living things. Now, number two, living cell can also exist as a colony. When you talk about living cell existing as a colony, this is talking about a cell of different type. Take, for instance, chlamydomonas coming together to form a ball. A ball. In this case, they are joined together by a cytoplasmic strand. Now, when you have something like this, and you have you have something like this now this is giving us an example of cells existing as colony now the circle there is representing different cells different cells they are joined together by cytoplasmic strands to form a big ball now when you look at this physically 
this particular ball, we have all the chlamydomonas cells joined together by cytoplasmic strand to form one single ball. Now, this is a colony of chlamydomonas. Then we call it vovos. Vovos. These particular ones, they are flagella. They lock it up together and all of them, they depend on each other and they move together as a group. So when cells exist in this form that they are joined together to form a big ball, we say they exist as colony. So apart from this, we have other organisms that also exist as colony, like Pandorina. However, the representative of that group is Volvos, a group of chlamydomonas coming together, connected by cytoplasmic strands to form a huge ball. This is a colony. Now, living cell can also exist as a filament. Living cell can exist as a filament. When we say a living cell exists as a filament, we have different cells we have different cells coming together arranged end to end now in this case as a filament you will you will observe that unlike in colony that they all form a huge ball. In this, they form they arrange end to end. So when you look at it very well, you will observe that the cells they still look independent. They are only arranged end to end, and any of the cells may break out to be on its own. So when cells are arranged this way, an example of this is spirogyra. When cells are arranged this way, we say they exist as filaments, linear, and they arrange themselves end to end, unlike colony, where they come together and they are joined together by cytoplasmic strand. If they need to move here, they move together in a coordinated manner. But for spirogyra, they are just arranged end to end. That is when cell exists as a filament. And finally, cell can exist as a part of living organism. Cell can exist as a part of living organism. Now, when we talk about cell as a part of living organism, what we're actually talking about there is in multicellular organisms. In multicellular organisms, you see that we have different cells. However, these cells are dependent, like in unicellular, where we have independent cells. Those cells, when you see a unicellular organism, doesn't depend on another one. But in multicellular, the cells in the body, they depend on each other because they are specialized. Or like in unicellular, that one cell will carry out reproduction, excretion, movement, and every other thing. But in multicellular, that is made up of different cells, there is what we call division of labor. So the cells are specialized in doing different things, and that's why we have different types of cells, specialized cells in multicellular organisms, like we have blood cell, we have bone cell, in plants we have leaf cell, we have root air cell. So they are specialized during, doing different things. So when cell exists as part of living organisms, those cells are specialized cells. It's not one cell carrying out all the characteristics of living things. So before we leave that aspect, living cells can exist in four forms. As a free living, as a colony, as a filament, and as part of living organism. Now we move on to the structure of plants and animal cells.
plant and animal cells. When you are to draw these structures, there is need to include the important components there. And make sure you put them where they are meant to be, label them correctly, and you will be able to get your full mark. However, don't forget, your pencil must not be dull. And don't use ruler, especially while drawing. It has to be freehand. So to draw a plant cell, for example, you have this rectangle. This rectangle. As you are drawing it, make sure you know the names. The first thing you come across in your plant cell is the wall, just like a building. When you, are, when you get to your house, the first thing is the wall outside. So this is the cell wall. Then you move on to the next thing you see there. We call all these organelles. They are cell organelles. Now, the next thing you see after the cell wall is your cell membrane. It's the cell membrane. And here, you have this circle. What is this circle called? That's your nucleus. You have your nucleus. And in your nucleus, you have a smaller nucleus that we call nucleolus. Nucleolus. Then, you have this here and taking time to do it one after the other so that when you are drawing yours you will also know the steps to take and it's not a magic it's very simple and straightforward now this is a vacuole a vacuole we call it central vacuole because in plants it's centralized there a vacuole then after that at the top of the nucleus you have an organelle there. That organelle can, you also have it here. You have it here. Now, take notes on either of the two. You may decide to put it up or down, but one of it should have dots. Just the way I'm going to put it like this, should have dots. This dot can even be other, in other places. Now, the one you have here at the outside of the nucleus, we call it endoplasmic reticulum er endoplasmic reticulum now the one without dots because we have two types of endoplasmic reticulum we have two types of endoplasmic reticulum we have the smooth and the rough smooth and rough. So when you draw your cell, if you have your own dots at the top, wherever you have your own dots, that is the one you label as rough endoplasmic reticulum. If you have your dot at the top, that's the one you label as rough endoplasmic reticulum. If you have your dots below, that's where you label as rough endoplasmic reticulum. Is that taken? Why the one without dot is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. They are both endoplasmic reticulum. What makes this one rough is because of the dots that we have there. And this dot that we have has a name. And that dot is called ribosomes. Ribosomes. So when ribosomes attach itself to endoplasmic reticulum, that is when the endoplasmic reticulum becomes rough. Okay, so 
these are the components then we have this open space here you have your cytoplasm then two other important components that we must include we have this particular component that is usually regarded as a sausage shape organelle and that is your mitochondria mitochondria so you can put it just one to represent it or if you have other space left you can still put it somewhere so this is mitochondria then we have an import another important component or organelle which we must also show however whatever you are doing you must make sure you differentiate between the two and now this one i'm going to do this so that the examiner we know that there are two different components so i'm going to differentiate this put this here put this put this here so this one is mitochondria why this one is my chloroplast this one is chloroplast so by still doing you have been able to draw your plant cell however if i'm to label all the label is let them go into one side one direction except you have exhausted the space on that side if you are with me you will be able to label all of this i will letter them c e f g h i now a that's our mitochondria b that's the cell wall c this is the vacuole d you see that's the next line after the cell wall that's my cell membrane e that is endoplasmic reticulum but now to differentiate it i must write smooth endoplasmic reticulum this circle the red circle here the bigger circle is my nucleus why the smaller one the blue one is my nucleolus that's the nucleolus then this blue with the dots that's our rough endoplasmic reticulum then we have chloroplast and the space outside it anywhere here any empty space here i call that cytoplasm cytoplasm so that's your plant cell structure now let's look at animal cell in your animal cell you can see circular but for plant cell it is rectangular or you see in some textbooks something like a pentagon however it should not be circular because it has a rigid shape when we get to the differences we'll be talking about that now in your animal cell animal cell also so straightforward you draw your circle after that we you know we have only one instead of two in this place we have the blue and the red why here i'm going to have only one because in animal cell we don't have cell wall we start with cell membrane then you put the nucleus just like we have here let your endoplasmic reticulum the rough and the smooth let them be there your mitochondrion should come chloroplast must not show because it's absent in animal cell then the vacuole if the vacuole is present at all in animal cell it must be small it must be small then another thing that is in animal cell is lysosome you must put it there it's not in the plant cell also in the plant cell we left out goggy apparatus goggy apparatus you just have something like this arrange arrange like that and you just label it as goggy goggy j then this is k 
So that's the structure of plant and animal cell. Now let's look at the differences between these plants. Our okay, let's look at the function before we go to the differences. The components that we have discussed so far, nucleus, this circle one, this big circle. Nucleus is referred to as the brain of the cell. And that will help you to remember the function of nucleus. We have discussed nervous system on this platform. So you can visit our website to watch the video. Now when we talk about nucleus, it starts as the brain, meaning it controls all the activities of the cell. That's one of the functions. And another function of nucleus is that it is the nucleus that houses the genetic materials. Remember when we looked at the topic genetics in this, on this platform too, we said in a nucleus, we have chromosomes and we have gene. So these are the genetic materials. They are present in the nucleus. So that's the function of nucleus. Mitochondria, you know, you must have seen mitochondria, mitochondria, it's just singular and plural. Mitochondria is singular, while mitochondria is plural. Now, the main function of mitochondria, it is the site where energy is generated, and that's why it is described as the powerhouse of the cell. Described as sausage shape, and it's the powerhouse. You know, when we're talking about respiration, we say it's a process by which digested food combines with oxygen to release energy. That particular activity, respiration, takes place in the mitochondria. So it's a powerhouse of the cell. Chloroplast is only present in plant cell and is the site for photosynthesis where plants, green plants, produce their food. Gorgi apparatus, or you see gorgi body, some call it gorgi complex, still referring to the same thing. This is like the logistic department of the cell. Gorgi is involved in packaging and distribution of materials. So that's the logistic department. Don't forget, nucleus is the brain. Mitochondria is the powerhouse. Chloroplast is the site for photosynthesis. Why Gorgi is like the logistic department there where packaging and distribution of materials take place. Vacuo. Vacuole is for storage. Storage of waste products, storage of water, storage is for storage in cell. And we have ribosomes. Don't forget, ribosomes is what attaches itself to endoplasmic reticulum that makes that reticulum called rough. Now, the function of ribosome is to produce protein, protein synthesis. Protein synthesis. These ribosomes are produced by nucleolus. So if you ask the function of nucleolus, you write production of ribosomes. Nucleolus produces ribosomes, then ribosomes in turn we produce protein. So we call it sites for protein synthesis. And we have lysosomes. This is present in animal cell and the main function of this is waste remover. Waste remover transport of materials out of the cell. It helps to remove one out cell or any part of the cell that is worn out, lysosome is the one that the sanitation agent that will help to remove the waste. And apart from that, it can also help to fight intruders in the cell. So that's the main function of lysosome. Now endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum is meant for distribution of proteins. Don't forget Ribosomes is the one producing the protein. As soon as it is produced, the endoplasmic reticulum will help to distribute it, especially rough endoplasmic reticulum. But for the smooth endoplasmic reticulum to be involved in distribution of lipids. Then we move on to centrio is another component. We have talked about this extensively when we learned cell division, mitosis and meiosis. So centrioles is involved in cell division. And these are the components of cell. Quickly, what are the differences between plants and animal cells? 
looking at their structure, cell wall is present in plant cell while it is absent in animal cell. Chloroplast is present in plant cell, it's absent in animal cell. So plant cell has a definite shape while animal cell do not have a definite shape. Plant cell contains one large central vacuum. You can see from, the picture, from this diagram, one large central vacuum. It's large, it's one, and it's just there at the center. Then for animal cell, if at all the vacuole is present, it must be small and many. Don't forget, in plant cell, just one, but large. But in animal cell, it's usually absent, but if it is present, it's usually small and many. Nucleus in the plant cell lies on one side, as you can see, because vacuo has taken the space. Nucleus is just lying on one side, while in animal cell, nucleus lies in the center. In the center. And finally, food is stored in plants in form of starch, while in animals, it is stored in form of glycogen. Because when you talk about genetics, you are talking about how traits are passed from parent to their offspring. And don't forget, while I was explaining the function of nucleus, I said it is in that nucleus that we have the genetic materials. So genetic has to do with how traits are passed. That's heredity. And what is the cause of the differences between siblings? Their physiological or the genotype. Now, these genetic properties, they are embedded in the nucleus of the cell. So you cannot get through to those genetic properties without getting to the nucleus. So we have many of these questions that have been responded to. Someone said organelles and cell. You know, in a cell, we have components of cell, the parts that are labeled in the cell. That's what we refer to as organelles. All the mitochondrion, chloroplasts, they are what we refer to as the organelles. And Victoria is asking the function of the mitochondria. Mitochondria is the powerhouse. That's the one that generates energy. That's where respiration takes place. So that's the main function of mitochondria. Someone said, what's the difference between nucleus and nucleolus? As you can see from the plant cell on our board, this bigger circle, the red one, is the nucleus. Why the smaller one is the nucleolus. So a nucleolus is a small nucleus that is present in the nucleus. And I told you the main function of that nucleolus is to produce ribosomes. And ribosomes itself, in turn, we produce protein. So these are the questions for today. I want to appreciate every one of you. Both those that ask questions and the ones that were able to answer. But do yourself this favor. If you miss any of the sessions that we have had in time past, go to our website. The videos are there. Watch them and you can catch up with the missed sessions. Right now, we'll go into our session of question and answer. So I will display the question. All I need is for you to write your answer and send it to the chat. And that must be done quickly. I'll be giving you just a few minutes to do that. I'm sure we are all ready to do that. And beyond the questions I'm going to display on your own after this class, I would like you to try drawing the plant and animal cell and label them. Once you are able to get it, it sticks. So now we move to our question and answer session. So the questions are displayed on your screen. For the ones that are multiple choice questions, just put the letters A, B, C, or D, whichever your answer is. All right. Thank you all for the responses you have sent. Now we are going to look at the answers together. 
and after that, who announced to you how you are fed in the assessment. The question number one says, in what organ is the genetic material found inside? The correct answer is C. Genetic material is found in the nucleus. And the genetic material we are talking about, they are the chromosomes and the genes, just like one of you asked. Number two, the function of the nucleus is to A, say, strengthen the cell, B, store food, C, control the activities of the cell, D, respire. The correct answer to question two is C, control the activities of the cell. Like I told you, nucleus is the brain of the cell. Number three, dash is the jelly-like substance in the cell in which chemical reactions take place. The correct answer there is cytoplasm. That's the jelly-like because the word cytoplasm itself is from two Greek words, cyto and plasm. That cyto is cell, plasm is liquid. So it's the liquid substance there. So the correct answer is cytoplasm. Number four, dash is the component of plant cell that is a site for photosynthesis. The correct answer there is chloroplast. Chloroplast. Number four, the correct answer is chloroplast. Number five, in which of the following parts of cell is chromosome found? The correct answer is A, in the nucleus. Chromosome is found in the nucleus. Don't forget the genetic material. And we are asked to use this particular diagram to answer question six to eight. The first one, which is question six, what is the part labeled four? The part labeled four is nucleolus. Nucleolus. Number six, the correct answer is nucleolus. And number seven, the organelle that produces the energy required by the cell is labeled dash. Is labeled two. Then number seven, the organelle is labeled is labeled two. And number eight, the structure labeled V, you know that's five, is that answer is rough endoplasmic reticulum. However, if you have written endoplasmic reticulum, you'll be pardoned because I will assume you are not seeing the dot there. But anything outside that, it's completely wrong. So that's structure labeled 5, which is V, is endo, uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. I take, run through that again. In what organ is the genetic material found inside? In the nucleus. So the correct answer is C, in the nucleus. And the, number two, the function of the nucleus is to, the answer is C, control the activities of the cell. Number three, dash is the jelly-like substance in the cell, which chemical reactions take place? Cytoplasm. Number four, dash is the component of plant cell that is a site for photosynthesis. Chloroplast. Number five, in which of the following part of cell is chromosome found? Chromosome is found in the nucleus. The answer is A. Number six, what is the part labeled IV? IV is nucleus. Number seven, the organelle that produces the energy required by the cell is labeled II. Number eight, the structure labeled V is the endoplasmic reticulum. That's rough endoplasmic reticulum. Number one, the correct answer is C. Genetic materials are found in the nucleus. Number two, 
The function of nucleus is to control the activities of the cell. Don't forget, it acts as the brain of the cell. Number three, cytoplasm. That's the jelly-like substance. Number four, the component of plant cell where photosynthesis takes place is the chloroplast. Question five, in which of the following part of cell is chromosome found? A, it's found in the nucleus. Number six, the part labeled IV, that is nucleolus. Seven, the organ that produces the energy required by the cell is labeled II. And finally, the structure labeled five, that's V, is the endoplasmic reticulum. Thank you. You have all tried.